Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Josh Bolton, an old friend and acquaintance from uh, various administrations, uh, served with real distinction in the Reagan, first Bush, second Bush administrations, now president of the Business Roundtable, had other jobs in the private sector in between to keep you going, I suppose, but, and most notably served, I guess, all eight years, right, every day of the George W. Bush administration as deputy chief of staff, director of the Office of Management and Budget, and chief of staff. That's pretty... Two years, two years as deputy chief of staff, three years as budget director, three years as chief of staff, and two years before that as policy director of President Bush's campaign. So it was almost exactly 10 years from end to end with my tenure with President Bush. Well, there's a lot to be learned from you about campaigns, the White House, the Office of Management and Budget for Management of Management and Budget? What is its official title? Office, Office of, of Management, Management and Budget, budget yeah. Right. But we can come back and do further conversations on this. So, yeah. Okay, so you're in the White House. Uh, well, I won't be counsel to the White House, I guess. So you're really in the yes. White House for eight years. What was the most memorable day, the, the moment that you'll, 20 years from now, you'll look back, back on and still shake your head about? Or was there one? Sure. I mean, anybody who served in government on September 11th, 2001 has to has to count that as the most memorable day of of their service uh, and it was for me because uh, as deputy chief of staff in the White House I was the acting chief of staff in the White House because as was our as our habit the chief of staff Andy Card uh, my predecessor and a great mentor uh, Andy traveled with the president, typically, wherever he went. And on 9-11, uh, those who were at least al alive and able to pay attention at that point know that right. he was not at the White House. He was in Florida doing an education event. Andy was with him. I was back at the White House um, on what was otherwise a very uh, routine and insignificant day with responsibility for running the White House. Oh, I forgot. Did, uh, did they fly down early that morning, or had they been there overnight? Very early that morning. So they had let taken off, Air Force One. Yep. You would run the senior staff. Was it, it was I just did the a normal senior, day? Just a normal, actually kind of sleepy, senior uh -huh. staff day. Um, so we, we, were, we were relatively early back from everybody's uh, first summer break that they had taken uh, since the start of the administration. Right. And um, a lot of folks had traveled with the president down to Florida um, because I think there were both substantive policy events and some political events down there. So um, probably a slightly larger crew than normal from senior staff accompanying the president down to, down to his event. Um, so it was a very pleasant, sleepy day uh, until so, until so, the plane. So hit. walk us through it. I mean, obviously, we could spend an hour on this. We won't. But let's give me the. So walk us through it. You're sitting in the deputy chief of staff's office, which is right next to the chief of staff's office right. on the which, down the hall from the Oval Office. In the uh, in the west, the West Wing is, as you know, Bill, very well um, because you hung out there a little bit, quite a bit. Um, it's a it's a tiny place, and. Um, so the deputy chiefs of staff, deputy chief of staff, shares a suite with the chief of staff, and there's a reception area in between. The chief of staff has the large corner office, large by West Wing standards, and the deputy chief of staff has a, a modest, right. a modest, what most people would consider a modest size office uh, across the reception area. Um, in in the private sector, it would be a it would be a tiny office, right. but it, it would go to an associate in the, that size an associate in a law firm would have. Um, but uh, the three rules of real estate apply um, no place more profoundly than in, in the White House, which it's location, location, location. So that suite is just, you know, 20 yards down from the Oval Office. And not far from the vice president's. Right next door is the, is the vice president's office. Um, so, what um, happens? So, uh, a routine day, I, uh, I have the TV on in the background, and I see TV coverage of um, 
one of the towers having been hit by a plane. The initial reports were that it was a, a small plane, and I assumed that, you know, a, uh, a neophyte pilot um, had, you know, gone astray, or it was a, a solo pilot who had had a heart attack, something like that, and thought, oh boy, you know, that gee, that's a that's a tragedy, but not a you know not an uncommon or peculiar thing. Um, but then, as it as it began to develop, and it was clear that it was not a Cessna or something that had gone into the building, uh, I walked down to the situation room, which, as you know, is uh, it's in the ground floor below the the main floor of the West Wing, right next to the White House mess. Um, which is a, it's really a communication center. It has secure facilities for meetings, and it has representatives from um, the intelligence agencies and so on who man a, a communication center. Not as fancy as what you see in a Disney movie, but it, that's basically the idea. And permanently staffed, right? Permanently so staffed right. by professional people, but who have communication with all of the intelligence agencies and all of the non, non-intelligence agencies in government. It's supposed to be the information nerve center for the White House. I went down there and uh, because I figured I'd get a better sense of what was going on, and it looked troubling. And... Uh, while I was down there, a uh, we, we saw on the screen the second plane hit the tower, and it was at that moment that my heart sank, and I knew that it was a, a very grave situation. And so you did what? Did you call? Did Andy Card know this at the same time as you did on the road, or did the president know, or um, who tells whom, and that kind of who calls whom, and how does that work? The, there's always a national security advisor traveling with the president, so the situation room, by by routine uh, uh, protocol, would have been directly in touch with the national security advisor, or I think in in this case the uh, the chief of staff to the national security council was traveling with them and um, would have notified the. Uh, uh, whoever was the national security advisor with the president at the time. I'm, I'm thinking it was Steve Hadley because right. Condi because Rice, Rice was in the White House. Yeah, right? She's the Condi Rice was in the White Steve House. Steve was the deputy. Yeah. Steve was the deputy. Um, um, uh, so they would have they would have been informed, but the, the information would have been flowing very rapidly down there. But what I did first was uh, I said... Uh, Where's Dr. Rice? And they said, well, she's in that conference room right there meeting with her whole staff for her regular big senior staff meeting. And so uh, I walked into a, a meeting of about 30 people, and she started to introduce me to, the, oh, this is Josh Bolton, our, our chief of staff. And I, I waved her off, and I, I just pulled her out. And I said, a, a second plane has has hit the other tower, this is an attack. And so she got it immediately, she disbanded the meeting, and she and I went up to the vice president's office, um, which, uh, which is where then for the White House the authority would be, um, with her as national security advisor, me as acting chief of staff in the White House, and the, the vice president sitting in for the president in the White House, although um, the decision-making authority still rests with the president sure. at that moment. And he was in his office? He was in his it. office. We, we talked about what might need to be done and so on. And while we were having our conversation, a Secret Service agent, a big Secret Service agent, came in and said, Mr. Vice President, we have to leave now. And he came around behind, the, he was obviously part of the vice president's detail. Um, we were standing, the agent came in around behind the vice president, picked him up from behind, and started running with him. So, the, you know, the vice president's legs were kind of moving, <laughs> but he was, 
uh, he was basically being moved by a Secret Service agent uh, with great urgency, um, leaving Condi and me standing there. Um, yeah, you guys aren't in the line of succession. No, so, you know, no one cares about yeah. you. <laughs> well, I, as Deputy Chief of Staff, I didn't even have Secret Service protection. No, and mm-hmm. Condi had some, but Is that right? um, but she's not in the line of succession, so they right. they care about taking care of her, but it's right. not the top priority. Um, so we we talked a bit about what to do, and uh, eventually um, did what fortunately we had been trained to do, which was make our way to a bunker that um, prior to 9-11 was the existence of which was classified, but which is no longer classified. And we made our way down to that bunker and joined the vice president there to uh, to be the command center for a White House that was being evacuated by the Secret Service. And that's where those photos are, I think, from that morning of right. uh, Vice President and Condi and right. you and some others. Yeah. And then did you, I can't remember, did you stay, uh, we'll get off this in a minute and move on to it, but it is amazing. I mean, I remember it too, and it was, an, uh, of course, I was just a bystander, but did you stay there? How long did you stay there? Did you stay there for the day, or did you also evacuate that eventually and move elsewhere? We stayed the uh, the entire time. Well, okay. Because uh, I know they evacuated the They evacuated the everything else. A couple and of the speechwriters came to our office. Yeah. What if, what if we had worked at the standard before? Because they needed a computer to work from. This is pre iPhone, right? And, uh, you know, they, they, they commandeered one of our offices, the Weekly Standard. I think they ended up reassembling at a law firm, maybe downtown. Yeah. Or something. Well, there were, there were several reassembly points, right. but none of this had been uh, scripted out in advance. Uh, we were ill prepared for an attack on the homeland, um, but we were. We were better prepared than our predecessors, who may have been better prepared than their own. Um, and in fact, the facilities we were using weren't built for the purpose of a, an attack on the homeland. They were, they were built for Cold War purposes. Mm-hmm. This is where the, the senior staff was supposed to go in the event of a nuclear attack mm-hmm. from the Soviet Union, right. which um, uh, Thanks, thanks in part to the to the efforts that you participated yeah. in was was no longer a a threat and right. had not been for twenty years, well ten, ten years, ten years yeah. at that point, um, and the really the the sense of of threat and necessity for preparedness had atrophied in the meantime, and so. We we fortunately um, had um, had a deputy chief of staff for operations who had made sure to train the senior staff about the existence of the bunker. Hmm. But I knew from talking to many predecessors from the Clinton administration that they had not even known that the bunker existed. Right. So would not have known that there even was such a place to go to. Um, and we had no plans for where people should go. And the, uh, the most telling part of our lack of preparedness was the difficulty of communicating, uh, which, which you made reference to, where it was hard to tell people where to go from our own staff. It was hard to connect with the rest of the government. And interestingly, it was hard to communicate with the American people because the president had been uh, the Secret Service had lifted the president out of Florida, and he was he was in the air on his way to an Air Force base, uh, not too far away. And uh, we all agreed. Um, the vice president, speaking on the phone to the president, agreed that it was it would be useful to for um, somebody from the the White House to go on the air and give a message of continuity, comfort, and so on. And we had no way to do that because the, the White House grounds had been evacuated. We didn't know whether it was safe to come out. And the press room had been evacuated. So there were no press there to film the event. No, even, cameraman. <laughs> no cameras to film the event, even if we had wanted to say something. So the first official, the first US government official of any kind that I'm aware of to make a statement 
about 9-11, I think, was Senator John McCain, who happened to be at the CNN studios for an unrelated interview. Is that right? I forgot that. Any takeaway? I mean, I'm sure there's so much more we could say, but any other takeaways for you from that day, moments, or things that you'd want people to, to know? I mean... Um, people rose to the occasion, it seems to me, in general. Is that the, your... People did. They're, they're uh, in, inside the White House, about all the people that we worked with. Um, there, was, there was shock. There was horror. Um, I think there was great empathy for the people who, who perished in the attack. I mean, it, it was hard to watch that footage without, without being very deeply moved. And having in your thoughts the uh, not just the victims but all the family and friends of those people who were probably watching on TV right. as as their loved ones died uh, but through all of that the uh, the government apparatus um, I thought performed well given the constraints that we had on our, our technological capability to communicate and direct things. One of, the, one of the things that did happen on 9-11 at the, in the bunker was that we were able to draw into the bunker some key U.S. government officials. Um, I eventually tracked down our communications director, Karen Hughes, mm -hmm. who uh, had been uh, off campus at the time of the attack, and she had gone to, as, as, as most moms did at that moment, she had gone to pick up her son at school. And I had tracked her down, and I, I think we found a, a military vehicle to get her and bring her down to the White House. And she ended up being the official that uh, the White House sent out to make a public statement but it was several hours after the attack, and the venue she used was uh, the FBI's um, mm. press room, which, the, I mean, the FBI being a pretty secure place and not too far from the White House, that's, that's where she went to, to go make a, make a public pronouncement. And at the end of the day, you were, sure you were there, and when the president came back, obviously, what was that like? That must have been... Um, that, that was, um, as, as horrifying as 9-11 was, that, uh, that was memorable in a, in a goosebump kind of way. Um, I was on the, I was on a, a conference call with, with the president who had been strongly advised by the Secret Service not to return to Washington until the next day, until they were confident that it was secure, that there were no more flights in the air, and so on. And uh, he said, absolutely not. The people need to see the president uh, at the White House at this moment. So it was, you know, as soon as we can get the logistics worked out, um, I'm on my way back. And so he, he flew back into Washington I don't remember what time he arrived, but it was late afternoon, yeah, early evening. That's, that's my memory, yeah. Um, our chief speechwriter, Mike Gerson, who may have been one of the people hanging out at your office. I don't remember. I th yeah. Um, it was John McConnell, I think. And, yeah. And well, they had been... David Fromm, I can't remember. They had been working already um, right. on remarks, so he was back in the White House. Most of the senior staff was back in the White House by the time the president arrived. Um, the, in while he was still on the ground at the Air Force Base in Nebraska, I think it was, the president had already convened a, uh, a national security conference call, teleconfer video conference. Um, he'd given out instructions. Um, by the time he landed back, the you know the speechwriters, he had already told the speechwriters the the key messages that he wanted to convey. They sat down, immediately started working on it, and he, he went on television. It, it wasn't the best appearance of his presidency, but it, it, was, it was pretty darn good under the circumstances and delivered the right message. And the performance of, I thought, the whole, the whole government apparatus of, of the people with whom I worked in the White House, I, th I thought through the whole thing was, was exemplary, appreciating the gravity of the situation um, not panicking and understanding the, the importance of the presidency at this moment, 
not for the people in New York City for whom we could do relatively little. It was that that was up to the emergency responders there, but for the rest of the country and the world. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Well, that's that's well said, and that's a it's it's hard to one one one's own thoughts go back to so many other things that happened that day and the days after. But maybe we should jump ahead. Was that that was the most memorable moment in the White House? Uh, Scariest moment in the White House was that. Also yeah, it, it, interesting. Most people would think that the that nine eleven would have been the scariest moment, and it it was scary, but it it was also a, a moment of some determination. Um. Uh, and 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 clarity of purpose. Right. That uh, you know, as soon as we un we began to understand over a period of hours what had happened. There was clarity of purpose in the government. There was there was never a doubt in my mind, and I think most people's minds, that uh, we were not going to let this event um, intimidate the the United States of America. And we basically knew what to do about it. You know, the intelligence agencies were uh, even the day it happened were right. pretty close to figuring out who did it, and president and his National Security Council are already at work on um, punishing the guilty and making sure it didn't happen again. And then the job for the rest of the government would be to try to harden America against uh, any kind of similar attack. So the, uh, I, th I think you get most scared in government when you don't know what to do. And so we knew what to do on 9-11. The scariest moment for me uh, as a government official was during the financial crisis. Seven years later, at the, at the end of, the, of President Bush's eight-year term, um, when we, uh, which was a cascading crisis that unfolded over a period of weeks, usually on the weekend, yeah. and um, I think I think everybody involved in that will admit that um, many times we thought we knew what the right thing to do was, but we weren't sure. And many times we were wrong about what the right thing to do was. He, you know, the the world's greatest experts on financial markets um, were. Uh, were perplexed about about how to handle it and how to prevent the world from spiral, spiraling into an event similar to or worse than the Great Depression, which which is how the Fed chairman Ben Bernanke described the the possible outcome to President Bush in the midst of the crisis. I mean, and I remember talking to not so much to you, I think, but to your deputy general Camp on some during those unbelievably long days you worked and uh, just trying to get some clarity since I had to pop off about it on TV or write, write about it in the magazine or I guess in my New York Times column for that year. But um, you really, I mean, you had some experience. You've worked at Goldman Sachs and had experience in finance. My sense is you really ran that response, obviously not telling Ben Bernanke necessarily what to do about the money supply, but out of the White House Chief of, Staff, Chief of Staff's office, I guess that, that magnitude of event is going to be run out of the White House with all res you know, while obviously paying due res respect to the Treasury Department and the Fed and all these other agencies, right? I mean, well, there's a there's a lot of of control and centralization in the White House when presidential level decisions need to be made. That's that's the way it should be. That's the way it needs to be. Um, in the case of the financial crisis, we were blessed to have at the Treasury Department Hank Paulson, who had been. Uh, chairman of Goldman Sachs for a number of years, had spent most of his life uh, in the financial markets and was probably, by both experience and disposition, among the best people on the planet to have been in charge of the Treasury Department at that moment. We also had at the Fed a, a, a brilliant economist um, and, and, and I think superb steward of U.S. monetary supply in Ben Bernanke, who had done his doctoral work on the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. 
and we also and as a as a third leg to that stool we had as the president of the New York Fed which is a crucial uh, place because the New York Fed had supervisory responsibility over all of the entities that were in the process of of failing during the financial crisis um, we had there a fellow named Tim Geithner who was well experienced in government service and through both Republican and Democratic administrations and uh, ended up being um, President Obama's appointment to Treasury Secretary. So we, we had a troika of decision makers um, on whom the president relied heavily. So uh, although you're right that in a, in a crisis like that, the decision making has to be centralized in the White House. Um, the the president in turn relied very heavily um, on Paulson, backed up by Bernanke, backed up by Geithner, and so we were in during the crisis. We were in you know hourly is an exaggeration, but every few hours in touch with uh, with those officials, and in particular from the White House in touch with Paulson who communicated during the crisis, um, sometimes several times a day with the president. And it, and it was my job as chief of staff to make sure that, that that communication was clear, that the directions to the rest of the government were clear, uh, and that the president had what he needed to make um, good and timely decisions. Was there a moment when you realized, gee, this isn't just an unfortunate recession or a bit of a financial problem? like? That we've seen before, or you know, read about even before. This is a kind of once in a generation, maybe once in a lifetime moment. Was it obvious? I mean, was there a day yeah. when you woke up, or wow? Uh, I, you know, I don't remember the moment when I when I realized the the magnitude of the crisis that we were in the midst of, um, because there were so many of those right. moments that that seemed to happen every weekend for a period of a couple of months um, in the late summer and fall of 2008. Um, the, uh, the really sinking moment I remember, um, and I'm surprised I don't remember the date now, was uh, I think toward the end of September when it had become clear that um, the only way that we could prevent a death spiral in the financial markets was for the U.S. government to step in massively with money and basically bail out the people who were responsible for the crisis in the first place, a horrifying thing for a president of any stripe to have to do. Um, but we needed to go to Congress to get that money. Right. And we had requested $700 billion, that's billion with a B, $700 billion to be appropriated by the Congress to the president to hand out to the people whom everybody blamed for the crisis in the first place. Uh, not surprisingly, this was a hard sell on Capitol Hill, especially with the president's own party. Uh, you know, Democrats didn't like it because it was a bailout of the banks, right. whom they don't like. And Republicans didn't like it because it was a bailout. More, you know, more tax dollars being, being spent on, uh, on what they viewed as sort of subsidies to the private sector that should stew in their own juice. And so we had a really hard time twisting arms, persuading members of Congress to go along and eventually, t the time came when we couldn't wait any longer. We needed to get the money. And we and the uh, leadership in, in the House decided, you know, we need to go for a vote. A Republican leadership in the House decided we need to go for a vote. Um, and it was one of those rare instances where we decided to go for a vote not knowing how it was going to come out. Uh, we went into the vote that day uh, nervous, uh, and it turned out with justification. The, uh, the vote failed. 
Republicans and Democrats deserted us, but the, I mean, the, the tough votes were the Republican votes who deserted their president who was asking for this money and authority. And uh, on that day, I think the, the stock market lost more of its value than it, than it had ever in its history. I think it was 700 points yeah. on the Dow that it lost on that one day. Fortunately, it was a Friday, which, which gave people an opportunity to recover. Uh, and so the next week we set about trying to figure out, okay, how do we modify the proposal a little bit? How do we bring aboard more members? And the really interesting thing is that the members, it being a Friday, um, there, was a, there was a break coming up. Um, I think for uh, either Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. And so they had to go home to the constituents. And the constituents, who under most circumstances would have said, uh, hell no, I'm not having my tax dollars go to bail out those Wall Street people, they, they would have seen their 401ks decline by 10% or more in just a few days and so they put a little heat on the congressman and they came back with a better attitude and we eventually got it but the that that friday when the when the vote failed and and i saw the vote going down you know you you're watching the little ticker of the of republicans eye and democrats and you know the numbers kind of move a bit because they can change their votes and uh, and I saw that the republic the number of I votes wasn't going to get above 218, and then the votes really you know started to they they sort of crested yeah, right. somewhere, and then they just really started to drop off as uh, as a stampede effect was taking place. I've I have rarely had a sinking moment like that in my uh, in my 20 years in public service, and I hope I never see such an event again. By the time you left on January 20th, 2009, and handed it over to President Obama, did you guys think, I mean, whatever one thinks about his stimulus and other decisions he made, did you basically think we were going to get out of the woods okay, that we had sort of been through the worst of it? I, I, or I can't remember anymore how long the... Yeah. 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 I mean, the, uh, once, we, once we got, eventually we got the tarp in place, uh, once we had put in place mechanisms to prevent the auto companies from going bankrupt, which they were threatening to do uh, in early January without some relief. Uh, once those events were in place, um, most of us who had worked on it were confident that uh, the worst of the crisis was over. Um, now it wasn't clear that there, you know, there wouldn't be aftershocks right. and so on. It turned out there weren't, and um, but basically the financial crisis was over before inauguration day on January twentieth. We didn't know that for sure. And the ripple effect in the real economy continued. The ripple to, effect you know. in the real economy, but the but the disintegration of financial markets, which was what was threatened. Right. Uh, during the financial crisis, um, that prospect w had ended by the time we handed over the keys to the Obama administration. And how much do you think it's a fair criticism to say that even if people did respond well in the crisis and in the moment, they didn't see it coming, the experts weren't as expert as they thought, and the sort of, and they're more sophisticated and less sophisticated versions of, let's call it this populist critique of expertise. But I've always thought the combination of some failures in the execution of the war in Iraq and the failure to see it coming in 07, 08, and a lot of confidence that this couldn't happen again if you listen to Alan Greenspan or even, I think, Bernanke in his first year, early years as Fed chairman. Those two together really did combine to lay the groundwork for a resurgent populism on both the left and the right. Or sense yeah, I think they did. Um, and Maybe unfair, uh, but I mean, that's life. But it's hard to tell people. Well, <laughs> yeah, actually... You know, I'm not, I'm not in the crowd that thinks it's deeply unfair. I mean, gov government has a responsibility to perform just like any company does, and uh, government failed to anticipate and prevent the financial crisis. Now, we responded, I think, effectively when it happened, um, but um, I think 
you know, your average citizen has reason to expect that government shouldn't allow things to get to that point in the in the first place. Um, you know, Bill, I think as much as as much as that, as, as the loss of confidence in our governing institutions that the financial crisis engendered, um, that I think that had a huge effect on the kind of political atmosphere we're facing today, yeah. um, as well as just the after effects of the financial crisis, where. Um, the you know the stock market eventually recovered wealthy people eventually recovered but um middle class americans uh didn't and and are, are still uh, many of them still haven't gotten back to the place in the value of their home in the in the buying power of the family income and so on uh, that they had before the crisis, and I think that's really, really fueling the kind of um, pessimistic, not just anti-government, but anti-institution mm -hmm. sentiment that is is fueling today's populism. Yeah, it's like a delayed effect, maybe. I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Or, or well, I yeah, or an ongoing effect. Yeah, fair I mean, I think, yeah. I think. I think what we're experiencing today didn't suddenly right. happen upon us. I think it's been building. Yeah, very much so. Certainly going back the 10 years to the financial crisis, but, but probably a decade or two before that. It's been right. building over time to the point where um, a, a large proportion of middle class Americans will tell pollsters that they don't think their kids will have a better life than, than they had. And to me, that's a tipping point in, uh, in our politics. And I think that number started to tip over about three, four years after the financial crisis when, like Bill Galston made this point, actually in a conversation like this, that uh, uh, people did think, well, okay, we've got through it and we'll come back and things will we'll get back to growth. And, to, and, and then they sort of, a the moment, they started to realize at some point that, oof, I'm never going to quite make it back to where I was, or yeah. my prospects are never going to make it back to where I thought they would be. Right. My kids' prospects don't look so great, and suddenly the kind of pessimism becomes much deeper than we've been through a rough patch, but you know we'll be back to back to normal, so to speak. Yeah, and and here's an interesting thing, which is that in 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 some, some polling that I've seen, if you ask people, uh, are you today where roughly where you expected to be? Uh, when you were in college, um, hmm. you get wealthy people answering yes. You get very poor people answering yes. And the people who are most disappointed and disaffected are the people in the middle. Hmm. Because the, the very poor never expected to, to do any better. The, the very rich are you know, sort of blessed from the beginning, uh, bored on third base. And, and it's the folks in the middle who, largely white, middle-class Americans, who, who feel most let down and disaffected. And um, I think that's your Trump voter. Yeah. Well, that's a long conversation in its own yeah. right. But let me get, I want to get back to the White House, just to those seven years in between September 11th, 2001, and September 2008, um, particularly the, your tenure as chief of staff. I just think people would be fascinated to, what is it like? I mean, it somebody isn't quite like West Wing on the one hand, or on, uh, or like a political science textbook on the other. What's your day? How does it work if you're chief of staff to the president? When does your day begin? What is your, what happens each day? Is there a typical day? Maybe every day is itself. I don't know. Um, what would surprise people on the outside? To, to yeah, at, actually, West Wing is a pretty. I, I vaguely recall is is a pretty yeah, good I haven't seen it much is a pretty good facsimile. Exactly. I, I stopped watching it when I got to the West yeah, Wing because yeah. I, I figured I do this for a living. Why do I need to why do I need to watch this for entertainment? Um, but uh, you know when the when the the president asked me to be chief of staff at the beginning near near the beginning of 2006. So what happened? Yeah, so there was he, they thought it was time for change, and he had been chief right. of staff for five, five years, years which by the way made him the longest serving chief of staff in modern history. Wow. Um, I think only one chief of staff in history served longer than Andy. It 
was Sherman Adams, awesome. who was one of the first chiefs of staff right. serving President Eisenhower. So you're over at the Office of Management and Budget? I'm at the Office of and Management and Budget. How do you get asked to be chief of staff by the president? President, president calls me up and says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of making a change, and Andy and I are talking about it, and uh, uh, he and I agree that you're, you're the best replacement, and of course you say yes. Um, the, uh, and I remember at, right after it was announced, somebody came up to me and said, you know, gosh, how can you, how can you do this? You know, you've, you've been, you've been going flat out for all five year plus years of this administration, deputy chief of staff, budget director, you were on the campaign before that, you know, how do you have, how do you have the energy to take on the, the toughest job? below the president in in Washington and and the only thing and I realized the only thing that crossed my mind was god thank god I don't have to be the budget director anymore <laughs> uh, because that is a hard job yeah. and and here's the difference um, which which may help uh, clarify the the roles the budget director has to be on top of everything in the budget it's now with the time I was doing it's a three it was three and a half trillion dollars it's now four trillion dollars and you got to know something about everything to help make the decisions on how you're going to allocate uh, allocate resources and so on uh, and you don't you don't get to decide really what's in your inbox you, you have to deal with the inbox as it is the luxury in becoming chief of staff is uh, you get to serve the president directly and you help decide um, what issues the president is going to focus on. And if you're doing your job right, you're helping the president focus on the real presidential issues, and you're pushing off all of the other decision-making to, um, to the many capable members of the White House staff and the cabinet. And so there's the luxury. You don't, you don't get to choose what's in the inbox. Uh, necessarily, but uh, you have a luxury of narrowing things down to the truly presidential issues, and that I found was a was a huge luxury in moving from OMB to chief of staff. Uh, and the other luxury was working for George W. Bush, who is a is a fantastic human being and a superb leader. And there's there, there's no substitute if you want to be a successful chief of staff. There's no substitute to having a having a good president. Yeah, having good having good bosses in general in life is a yeah, good it's a always, good recipe for yeah for both always happiness always and always reasonable success. Always find a good boss. I always then tell young people that. Right? Yeah, then you then advice. you'll be fine. Yeah, right. So what's it like? So I, took, I hope you tell the people who work for you that. that yeah, they, I do. They should that, move on and, as quickly as possible. They, right? and they, no, they they've do, arrived. They do. Um, so what's it like? I mean, what what's I mean? It's, you're running. I guess it's hard not to get to try to make yourself not get bogged down in the day to day schedule and this and that and press interview here. But I guess when you're White House chief of staff, you delegate that to the press secretary, you do, and and, director, and so and I was forth. blessed in that way too, both in in the quality of the staff around the president and in the cabinet. Um, but also blessed to come in, in toward the end of the administration, in the last third of the administration, when we had well-established protocols and um, uh, people knew what they were doing. So, you know, messing with the schedule, interviews, all that kind of thing. Um, I cared about that, and I, you know, periodically be involved, and I certainly had to be informed. Um, but I didn't. I, I didn't have to bear that burden myself. There were there were people uh, whom I trusted to make those judgments and those recommendations more than I trusted my own. And whom the president trusted. So. And whom important. the president trusted, and uh, and the president uh, trusted me. It, it was very important. He always backed me up, so that um, whatever I wanted to do with personnel. Uh, or anything else, he was. If, if it was within my purview, he he was completely supportive, and that um, that gave me the the authority to do my job effectively. 
any ethical fights with cabinet secretaries you'd like to tell us about? Or <laughs> we, you know, been, we they've been reported otherwise. I suppose some of them. We we had relatively few. You were pretty. Um, I mean, you know, we we made some changes in the cabinet when I when I came when I came in was a good time to make some changes. Um, so there were there were changes in the cabinet. Um, there were changes in the White House staff. I mean, I I made a change in the press secretary, for example, who uh, at the time that I came in, I, I did not think he was doing a good job representing the president, although he had been, you know, entirely loyal and, right. and decent and a, and a long time serving the president. Um, but the president asked me, uh, so what changes do you want to make in the staff? And I said, well, I want to, I want to replace the press secretary. And he said, why? And I said, because I don't think he's he's representing you as effectively as you you ought to be represented. And so the president, I I think a little reluctantly, only out of out of loyalty, uh, he said, fine. And so that's what we did. We we had a new press secretary, roughly around the same time that I started my job. And you started in early '06. Early '06, yeah. Because yeah. I remember coming to see you once or twice, really more just like a middleman almost, bringing people in who were making the case for the surge in Iraq, which you were more involved in, I would say, than the, maybe was publicly reported at the time. And middle, late 06, obviously, one couldn't really let, let it be known that you were considering a major change until you do the change, obviously, and, and, uh, and get the Secretary of Defense on board and all that. But you played a pre uh, some appreciable role in that, I think. You and Steve Hadley was who was national security advisor. I did. Uh, Steve had the had the principal role in advising the president, but um, I I noticed something early on in my tenure as chief of staff, which was that um, I I didn't think the bad news was getting to the president as clearly as it otherwise might. And here's where my fresh perspective had had a lot to do with it, which was I was I was getting a lot of my news from TV and from listening to the Sunday shows, mm -hmm. you know, on, on which you would appear periodically, and from uh, sort of listening to voices who, uh, who wanted to educate the neophyte chief of staff, um, uh, including and prominently you. Um, I know you're not supposed to be the subject of these interviews, no, but, no, I, no. Um, but I may turn it back on you. Um, but presumably you, you had a point of view about the way the war was being run. Right. You saw a new chief of staff come in who, who needed education or who was coming in relatively uneducated uh, on the subject. And you seized that opportunity um, you and I had known each other for uh, for a number of years. Um, I had I had confidence in your judgment, and I remember you brought in General Keene and Fred Kagan. Any, Fred Kagan and Kagan. And Jack yep. Keen, I think. Right. Yep. We had and, lunch in your office with you, and I think Joel Kaplan. Your right. And you, deputy, you, and maybe Hadley, and Ke Steve. And Ke I don't. Maybe not. I don't. No, not I think at that stage. Not at that stage, and right. and it would have been it would have been a different conversation yes. because Steve had been involved the whole way. Well, that, yeah, it was less I was that you needed to be educated. It was more that you didn't have a stake. I would say you could make a change without having to criticize. I needed. I you, needed to be educated. Well, whatever. But, which is which is why I had lunch with you. But why new people are better sometimes is also that they don't have an yeah. investment in the older policy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think it was just you and Joel Kaplan. Yeah, and it would have been a different conversation had Steve been there, um, because you were you were able to sort of back up to first principles and so on, and uh, what you and Keen and Kagan said coincided with what I had observed in my first few weeks as chief of staff, which was that the um, the president was. Um, I think getting an unrealistic view of how well the then current trajectory in our, in our um, strategy and tactics were proceeding. And you were, you were quite persuasive with me and, and helped make me an advocate for a, a shift in direction. Um, a shift was probably coming. 
Um, but if, if at that moment you had had to bet, the shift probably would have been cut our losses and get out. Right. Um, not, the, not the much more dangerous and consequential path of doubling down and seeking to provide um, uh, some security for the civilians in Iraq, which we had before then not really viewed as our mission right. in Iraq. Um, so I, uh, <clears throat> I, I rarely spoke up in meetings with the president when you know other people who are typically far more expert than I uh, were in the room, I, I commonly gave my opinion afterwards and I commonly passed on to the president what people were saying outside of the Oval Office, especially it was, if it was different as it often was from what people were saying inside the Oval Office. Uh, and so in partnership with Steve Hadley, who was himself headed in the same direction. Uh, we supported the president in his own st instincts that this needs to change. We, as against the consensus advice, including of the Joint Chiefs, mm -hmm. uh, we need to take this in a, in a different and more aggressive direction if we want the result to be good. Yeah, I know what you guys did was a model of managing that kind of thing in the middle of an administration when it's hard to, it's one thing to make a switch between administrations or whatever, but uh, obviously that was... Well, get credit, uh, strong credit uh, on that to Steve Hadley, who below the president um, worked with the then chairman of the chiefs, Pete Pace, um, and the two of them were very good partners in bringing along what could have been a very recalcitrant and resistant uh, uniformed service to what was being asked of them because I mean it's 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 one thing for politicians to make those right. uh, those kind of judgments uh, and put extra stress on the force and place more of our young men and women in harm's way um, um, it's it's another thing for the for the uniform people to to do that um, and huge credit to Steve Hadley and and Pete Pace and in creating, if not a consensus, a, a widespread acceptance and support for the surge policy that ultimately proved, I think, hugely successful. I, I mean, you don't have to answer this, obviously, if you don't want, I don't, but I'm just, you were actually White House Chief of Staff, and as you say, a well-functioning White House, which made a good pivot there, and then I think did well in late 08, though I guess they could blame you for not anticipating what happened between, but, um, and, you know, I think, anyway. How, so now we have the Trump administration, we're speaking in late March of 2017, leaving aside personalities and details. How much of, the, in general, how important do you think is it to have a you know, strong chief of staff, coherent White House, everyone on the same page? Or do you buy the argument that sometimes there's a case for a team of rivals, and, or at least in the early months of an administration, a sort of shakedown is gonna happen anyway? And uh, I'm just curious, I mean, we all read the, you know, read about it and watch it watch it but you were sort of there you probably maybe maybe you're maybe you're too biased to your own particular experience and we can discount that but i'm just curious how important you yeah think so so, I mean, so, I make, so yeah, discount just to, just, just to put on the other uh, so one could say for example reagan's was sort of chaotic but at the end of the day if you're going in the right direction that sort of swamps out all the details of you know various you know inartful you know, press statements and uh, zigs and zags, and that would be the count, that would be the argument for why it doesn't matter. The internal you know, the mechanics don't matter that much. Yeah. So, so discount what I have to say because everybody always thinks that what, what whatever they did is the is the best and only way to do it. Um, I mentioned I was blessed by the president I had and the colleagues I had and the structure that we had um, that contributed to uh, rational decision-making. How, however you might feel about the, the principles that were applied or the, the predispositions, you know, wh whether you agree with the Iraq war or the surge and so on, um, the, the Bush White House in most instances managed the process of decision-making well. And I'm, I am one who believes that it's extremely important 
to have a good and coherent decision-making process. Um, now, there, it's always turbulent at the start of administrations. It's always somewhat disorganized. It's, it's an inherently very difficult thing to do, in part because um, it's, you, you write on a completely blank slate. I don't, I don't think anybody, quite re, anybody who hasn't experienced it, uh, you have, uh, both in and out, um, the, the extent to which the White House itself is completely empty on Inaugural Day. Uh, I've, I've now seen it um, twice leaving and once entering. And uh, it's, the, the physical emblem of it is, is really striking that the, the day before Inauguration Day, there are all these people in there doing their jobs and, you know, these decisions are being made and so on. Overnight, the carpenters and painters are in, uh, tearing stuff out, recarpeting, putting some walls in that mm -hmm. the new folks want. Uh, and when the new crowd walks in, uh, any time after noon on January 20th, there's nothing on the walls, there's nothing on or in the desks. The computers are there, but their memories have been wiped clean. Uh, and if you're lucky, you know what your phone number is. And so there's not a big infrastructure on which to fall back where, you know, things are just happening normally. You have to, every White House has to create it from scratch on its own. So especially when you're taking over from the other party, I think. Especially when you're taking over from the other party, but not, not, ex yeah. not exclusively. The one time I was there with 89, taking over from Vice President Bush, taking over from President Reagan, a little easier, I think. Easier, but still. But still, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing or what I was supposed to do. Yeah. There's no, no one gives you like a list of things that you're supposed to do on your first day. No, you know? there's, no like, okay. there's no job description. <laughs> right. there, there's nothing. I mean, you, you probably knew you had a meeting to go to, but um, the person who was calling that meeting might not even be able to know how to reach all of the people who were right. supposed to come to that meeting. So have a little sympathy and, right. and, and tolerance for the, the turbulence that always comes. That said, uh, the, it is, uh, the quality of decisions, I believe, is directly, it follows directly in relationship to the quality of the decision-making process. And there is nothing wrong with a team of rivals in the sense of giving the president access to a wide range of disagreeing opinions. In fact, in my view, that serves the president right. best. Um, so the president should have, uh, uh, should have debates and disagreements between all, all of his senior advisors at some point uh, and should, be, and should uh, sort out what the best decision is coming out of those disagreements. That's, that's often how you, you come to the best decision is you let the ideas and the proposals compete. The problem arises when the process of making those decisions is unclear and where, where there isn't clearly one chief of staff in charge running that process, I think the president is ill-served. And you, you always felt you did have that. And, and I, I had it because it came from the boss. Yeah, and that, he thought that was the way to run it. Absolutely. And so everybody in the government, they, they might not have had much respect for me or my opinions. Um, and I, I'm, sure, I'm sure many, many of them were justified in a, in a low opinion of, of, my, uh, of my own views or abilities. But everybody in the Bush White House respected my authority as chief of staff because it came from the president. And the so cabinet secretaries. The cabinet secretaries, exactly the same. Um, so they knew that if they wanted to get to the president, um, they would have to go through the process that we set up. They also knew that I, that I, as chief of staff, as Andy Card had before me, would treat everybody fairly so that there, nobody would be denied access because we didn't like their views or anything like that. Um, but they would have to go through the right process so that everybody with an interest in a particularly uh, important issue, that is to say a presidential issue, 
would have an opportunity to have their views heard by the president in a forum, in a format that made it possible for the president to make a rational decision. That's, that, to me, that is the, the uh, absolute essence of good governance out of the White House. Um, and to the extent that this White House is struggling with that, I'd, um, I think they will, they will find they are making much better decisions, executing much better once they get that in place. One of the, I mean, some of these articles about internal White House practices, you know, written by people who obviously never worked in the White House and often haven't really covered it closely, they're, they're sometimes pretty misleading. I think there was one phony, or as Trump would say, fake news fuss about the new National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, whom I think we both know, and in fact, who was a, one of the strategists of the surge, sure. um, having implemented it a little bit himself in 2005, I think, when he was a colonel, lieutenant colonel, maybe. Um, did he have walk-in privileges for the president? Yeah, he didn't, and that was supposed to, allegedly didn't, and that was supposed to show him that he was not as important as, I don't know, Steve Bannon or someone. Yeah. The whole idea of it, I tried to explain to someone, I mean, I've only been a vice presidential chief of staff, but how the whole, the whole phrase is sort of meaningless, and do you agree with that? Is that I do, yeah. yeah. It's what, com- what does that it's mean, complete, even? I mean? It's completely meaningless. Right, and, okay. And I, maybe it means whoever can get past the president's assistant and get into right. the Oval Office, but... You know, if you're standing outside the Oval Office and the president wants to see you, you get walk-in privileges. Right. So, but in the real world, I mean, so I don't know. The Israelis bomb the Syria reactor. Let's just take something that's been written about and reported. Uh, how does it work? I mean, so, Steve Hadley, I suppose, is maybe the first person to hear about this from the Situation Room as National right. Security Advisor. Right. Does he just run up to the president to the Oval Office? Does he call you first? Does he stop by your office to pick you up? In our in our system, he would stop by my office to pick me up. Now, uh, in our system, um, I I arrived at, at the White House at usually about six fifteen or six twenty in the morning. Uh, Steve would have been there for at least a half hour okay. before that. And the reason we did that is that President Bush would get to his desk in the Oval Office every morning at about 6.45. He's a very disciplined man um, and uh, remarkably awakens, I think, without alarm every morning at 5.15, regardless of where he is, which makes international travel a little a little uh, difficult. Uh, and... So I would be the first to, in to see the president. Um, usually I give him five minutes, five, ten minutes to get settled and go through papers and things like that. But I would be in to see him before 7 a.m. He would every buzz morning. for you or you would just walk over? No, no, I would just, just walk just in. Just knock on the door walk in. Yeah. Just walk in. The door is open. You know, you walk, you walk past his assistants and uh, the door of the Oval Office is open. And in our system, the chief of staff just walks in and you start chatting with the president about his day about what's on his calendar, about why the speech he's giving that he okay, it's no it, good, right? is no good, and and what can be done about so it's it. Good to hear that from the president. Yeah, what can be done about it? I'm sure. <laughs> what can be done about it between now and noon when he's giving the speech, uh, and uh, and then shortly after seven, Steve Hadley, the national security advisor, would come in, and we would. Uh, I, I would always try to stay off of national security sure. topics until Steve got there, uh, and uh, the conversation would shift uh, mostly between the president and Steve to national security issues. And um, so, if it was something, you know, important, but in the routine course of things, Steve would bring it up at that time. Um, but if it was a dramatic development like the one you described. Um, then, then Steve would be directly in to see the president and uh, would pick me up on the way. We we had a great partnership in that respect. And then, if, if it had happened overnight, and the president would say, "Well, we need to get Secretary of Defense Gates and CIA Director Tanner, whoever it was, yeah. wasn't Tanner anymore, in there and help." They would be buzzed and told to get there within half an hour or whatever. Yeah, and, and, and Steve go. might do that himself overnight. Just say the president's going to want to see, you know, yeah. he, he's, he's asleep, but he's going to want to see all of you. And, um, you know, for some things, the, the national security advisor might decide that the president needs to be awakened. You know, 
the, the big question: Shall we awaken the president? Yeah. Uh, and and for that purpose, the uh, typically the national security advisor would alert the chief of staff and get his go ahead to to awaken the president. That's that's one of the joys of the chief of staff's job is you you get to be the filter of the occasion on which the president gets awakened. Like, like you know, okay you're, with being awakened. With the yeah, I guess. But, you yeah, I guess. But it, you know, it's stuff like you know, your daughter is in jail, kind of thing that oh. you don't you think you don't <laughs> want to <laughs> you don't want to keep from him, but you don't want to be the one that. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I I should say that never ended up in jail. There was right. there was the occasional scrape with the authorities, right, but right. Uh, to. Two fabulous young women who were, who were who were at the time, yeah, uh, college age kids. Yeah, that's not the call you want to make. I think that's really true. But that's what the chief. That's one of the things the chief of staff. How much would you say if the chief of staff's twelve hour day, maybe it was even fourteen hour day, is taken up with sort of stuff that's planned ahead of time? You're going to have a review of I don't know some initiative coming down the pike, or think about the speech for three weeks from now, or a scheduling meeting. I, I don't know if you did you run those yet, and how much is sort of this has happened somewhere. We need to have a you know the surprise. We need to have a sort of meeting in, in an hour on X topic. I mean. During during the day, um, the I mean the president's time is is scheduled in very small increments and it's full. You know it's in ten minute increments. It's almost as almost as bad as like a, a lawyer. A lawyer, yeah, yeah. Shot billing, lawyer. Wow, that's billing, billing you a hundred bucks for the ten minutes. Or more. I, I think guess. you're a little out of touch yeah, on rates yeah, there. Yeah, I guess not I, that I would know, but yeah. <laughs> but your colleagues at the business roundtable would. would yeah, they would, they would well know. They would know you're paying more than that now. Um, but uh, for the chief of staff, uh, I would typically plan to be with the president through probably about two thirds of his schedule for the wow. day. Um, you know, there's a third that's ceremonial that. You know, it's you know greeting the, you know receiving the first Girl Scout cookies, right. um, you know greeting the NCAA championship basketball team or something. Now some of those things you really want to go to, right. but uh, you got you you sort of have to budget your time and be a little cautious about not doing too much spectating. Um, so mo most of the day. Um, is is done on that sort of routine thing, but there are points in the day when the the stuff that's likely to be breaking and important would naturally come up. There is on President Bush's schedule every morning there was a national security briefing, and so it might just be the CIA's report on routine stuff. Um, but we would commandeer that if there was an important national security event, that that meeting would be taken over by whatever was happening then. Um, if it's an important uh, economic policy development, we probably already have on the president's schedule time to be briefed by his economic advisors. Um, and so, you know, Paul, the Secretary of the Treasury and the Chairman of the Fed might already be in there, the Secretary of the Treasury, the head of the National Economic Council, the U.S. Trade Representative. They, they're probably already at some point on the President's schedule, unless it's something completely out of the blue, in which case you, you reshuffle and put something on. For the Chief of Staff, then, I, I lived most of the President's day between 6.45 and roughly 6 in the evening when he would go up to the residence to have dinner with his family. Um, my day really started as soon as his day ended because that was then my chance to go back to my office, really return phone calls, do some reading, do, do some emails, and, and have a few meetings even. Your own meetings, yeah. Have some of my own meetings. Um, so I, uh, like my predecessor and like the National Security Advisor, I rarely had anything less than a 16-hour day and 18 was, was more typical. But I got to say, I never felt oppressed. Yeah. I, I, I know, I don't know how you felt uh, coming into work every day, but I, I felt I'm, I was one of the luckiest guys in the world. No, I did too. I had obviously one one hundredth of the responsibility or even the, the work, but I, I had very much the same experience too of 
sort of with certain relief sometimes uh, saying goodbye to the vice president, who was a wonderful boss, Vice President Quayle. He would go off, and his kids were pretty little when he was vice president. He would off, go off around 6 to have 6.30, I think, to have dinner with them at the vice president's residence right. and see them while they were still awake even and help them with homework and so forth. And then I, I would heave a big sigh of relief that, okay, he's now, gone. Now you can start now we do have like a – I mean, it's infinitely smaller than your staff. We do have a vice presidential staff to worry about. We have trips coming up. We have someone who's got a complaint about something. Or, you know, I mean, right? So you sort of start doing your own work to some degree um, once he leaves. So it's, it's Yeah, it's tough. all the same it's thing. It's double. I mean, so you're both a staffer to the president and running a pretty big organization, which you can delegate a lot of, but not ultimately. And then you can't not return a call to a cabinet secretary you, or to a... As, as a former chief of staff, you probably also had this experience, which is that one of your principal responsibilities is to make sure that the boss is not just well cared for, but is in good shape and properly rested right. and has a chance to exercise and so on. Um, because that is a, it's not just the pampering of right. the principal, PAL principal. It's, it's how you make it possible for him to do his job properly. President Bush used to comment regularly when he was dealing with uh, some of his foreign counterparts. Uh, he, he was very, uh, very attuned to what their mental state was and what their physical condition was. And mm -hmm. he would say, uh, President so-and-so isn't getting enough sleep and he's making bad decisions. Um, or, you know, so-and-so is too worried and is making bad decisions. And the one sure way to make President Bush angry, who, who was otherwise a very, you know, very easy to work for boss, but one of the sure ways to make him angry was to make him late, to make it impossible for him to get uh, 40 minutes of exercise, um, and to make it difficult for him to get a full night's rest so that he could do his job properly. He's not a, he's not a self-pamperer in any way, but he, uh, you know, having been around the presidency during his dad's time, um, having been a governor himself for a while, he knew that the most important thing he could do to make sure he was doing his job well was take good care of himself, and that falls on the chief of staff to make sure that, it, that he's able to do that. That's good. Yeah, I didn't really. Vice President Quayle took care of that. It was was in better shape than I am. Is in better shape than I am. I just let him worry about that. But I'm, uh, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you worried about that. A final, maybe just a few minutes. Um, how'd you get into this in the first place? I think people would be interested in that. You didn't start off as an OMB director or a deputy chief of staff or even as U.S. Trade Rep. Or I don't. Those, I don't look like an OMB director. All those director. high positions you had. People forget that sometimes. You were once a kid coming out of. Law school, is that your first government job, really? Law school, I, uh, I actually, I, I served in all three branches of the federal government um, uh, by the time I was 30. So oh, wow. I came out of law school, I was a law clerk for a year, so I got to serve in the judicial branch. Uh, I went to work as a lawyer at the State Department mm -hmm. in a civil service job, uh, which was a fantastic experience. Um, I got some experience in, in private practice, but then an opening came up in, um, in the field that I was then working in, which was international trade law. Uh, a great job showed up on Capitol Hill um, for the committee that writes the trade laws. The, in the Senate, it's the Senate Finance Committee. So they needed a, there was a vacancy in trade council I wouldn't, I wouldn't have planned it that way. I would have, uh, at a minimum, you know, tried to become a partner in a law firm or something, establish some f financial security before I jumped back into government. Uh, but the opportunity was too good, and I knew that the window doesn't open that often, and it certainly doesn't open wide. So I jumped through it and became, uh, I think at the age of 30, uh, trade counsel to the Senate Finance Committee which was my first job in the political side hmm. of government. And who um, was your boss there? I didn't know. Bob Packwood was chairman oh, of the Senate Finance Committee. Very powerful and, chairman. Yeah. A and, very knowledgeable and, one. Yeah. And really, I mean, with, um, uh, with a, 
a personal issue that I think de derailed an otherwise brilliant career, right. who was a superb senator, very substantive on trade issues, fantastic, uh, and uh, and uh, in many ways that himself an, an excellent boss, um, who was the man who uh, originated and shepherded through uh, the last ma major tax reform that we had in this country. So it's, it's quite telling that it was 31 years ago, 1986, right. that we last had a major tax reform. And it happened because uh, Bob Packwood went off with my boss, the staff director of the Senate Finance Committee, Bill Diefenderfer, and they had a couple of pitchers of beer at the Irish Times after a particularly depressing markup on a tax bill in the Senate Finance Committee, and they decided to just throw it all out. They were, they, they were in the process of just adding more barnacles onto an already overly complex tax code to try to win votes here and there, and they just threw it all out. They started from scratch, radical simplification, uh, and with the support of a bunch of Democrats in the Senate, Bill Bradley was, right. the, was the progenitor of many of those ideas. Um, they got it through, and they got it, they got it through a Democratic House, a Republican Senate, and signed by a Republican president. And uh, if there's a way to emulate that experience uh, in the current environment, that will be that will be much the, much to the good because we definitely need uh, radical reform of our tax code. I forgot I forgot that you'd work for Senator Finance and Repack, but I think of you so much. I guess when I first met you, you were already in the executive branch. What, what, what was your job in the, in the first Bush administration? You ended up at U.S. Trade Representative. I did. You I didn't did. start as U.S. Trade. I did. Oh, you did. Uh, the, uh, I, um, so f during the second Reagan term, I was, uh, I was on Capitol Hill as the Republican Trade Council to the Senate Finance Committee. And when President Bush, got a, Bush 41 got elected in 1988, it was a natural transition for me to take the expertise that I had in trade law and move it into the executive branch. So I became the general counsel to the That's US. That's right, Matt, but you didn't start as the, the trade rep. You, start, you were general counsel. I was general counsel to the U.S. trade representative. Who was Carla Hills? Carla Hills was, and uh, she was a brilliant uh, trade representative. That's where we were still trying to liberalize trade. It's, it's like uh, a and different era. She, <laughs> she successfully n negotiated both the, uh, in, uh, what's now called the World Trade Organization. Right. Um, and she negotiated the NAFTA, so much criticized today, but really I think one of the uh, most important and positive economic developments of, uh, of our time uh, was the successful negotiation of the NAFTA, which was, uh, th this history is often lost, it was negotiated by President Bush 41, it was right. negotiated and signed by President Bush 41, Carla Hill's in the lead, uh, and it was then implemented courageously by Democratic President Bill Clinton against the wishes of most of the rank and file of his party. And I, um, I think it's a, it's a demonstration of uh, good substantive judgment, but also political courage for which President Clinton deserves a lot of credit. He got, yeah, he got ratified by Democratic... Congress, I think in the lame duck session, maybe in 94, is that right? I don't know, it was late 93, maybe. I think it was 93, yeah. yeah. So just by I, I think it was just Congress, but, yep, with Republican but, votes, I think more than Democratic. With more, Republic, Democratic votes, with, yeah. with more Republican than Democratic votes, but to have the Democratic president, new Democratic yeah. president taking the lead on it, I think was, uh, yeah. was it w would not have happened without that. Yeah, I'll let you go, but you'll forget this. The, the, so I think we met when you were general counsel to the trade rep, and I was the Vice President Quayle's chief of staff. And Vice President Quayle was asked by the president, as vice presidents are, to do various tasks, some of them fun, some of them a little onerous. And one of ours was to, I mean, Carly Hills did this routinely, all the trade negotiations, including with the Japanese. And the issue of the day seemed to, was, first of all, we had a huge deficit with Japan. They were taking over the country. They were buying Rockefeller Center. They were a right. big threat, all this stuff. Um, and but we were supposed to open up the Japanese auto market to American autos which was very difficult at the time, and for all I know still is. It was, and still is. And we, we and so f I, we must have had six, I don't know, half a dozen trips to Japan, which is a long flight, and 
you know the the age drift thing is a, it's just tough when you're a staffer because and this is pre email and pre iPhone so you know you I just remember those just being grueling because you'd want, you'd have to be up during the night in Japan to be in touch with people in the office in the U S you right. to, but I remember meeting you as you and Carly Hills which she often came on these trips but you would come to brief the vice president so he was fully up to speed on yeah. what extremely complex you know little thing in their auto in their auto law really was was didn't look like a violation I mean, it didn't look like they were blocking all or imports but de yeah. facto they were blocking all imports by requiring I don't you know so the, the cars have a certain I can't remember what you know something or other that American cars didn't have or whatever right. I, I usually tuned out of those meetings and let you and Carla explain it to the vice president who knew a lot more about this than I did I yeah by the say. way I remember the vice president being very very attentive and astute well, he was from and Indiana obviously which had a pretty big auto industry yeah, at that point serious about it support of a lot of auto workers actually he had gotten a lot of union votes when he ran for the Senate and he was interested in those issues I'm 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 hopeful that the new administration will will take on their trade negotiating responsibilities with with similar seriousness and and with a similar objective which is not not the restriction of trade, but the expansion of trade by uh, by leveling the playing field, where U.S. companies are unfairly discriminated against. But otherwise, it let let competition uh, yeah. let competition play out. That's what's going to be best for us, uh, and for the global economy, which is what's best for us in the end. Those are good words on which to end, and I hope they. I'm sure the president's watching this conversation, and he'll take these words to heart. Josh, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.